the greatest social changes of the 20th century was brought about by a campaign that fought for a woman's right to vote. Previously, women were considered not mentally, emotionally fit to vote. Women were perceived as the fairer and frailer sex, chattels whose role in life was to support their menfolk and bear children. They, women, were subject to fainting fits and bouts of hysteria. The fainting could have been due, of course, to the tightly laced up corsets that women of the era were expected to wear, which severely restricted their breathing, and frankly, the way women were treated during this period was enough to make any woman hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> Women's struggle to get the vote had been a long running and torturous one, which had been thwarted for decades by successive governments. I'm now going to read you a poem written by a suffragette called Christine Perkins Gilman. She wrote this poem in 1911, and though it's shrouded in humour and sarcasm, the message is very clear. It's called, Women Do Not Want It. When the women's suffragette argument first stood on its legs, they answered it with cabbages. They answered it with eggs. They answered it with ridicule, they answered it with scorn. They thought it a monstrosity that should never have been born. When the suffrage argument grew vigorous and wise, and was not to be answered by these opposite replies, they turned their opposition into reasoning severe upon the limitation of our God-appointed sphere. We were told of disabilities, a long array of those, till one could think that womanhood was merely a disease, and the maternal sacrifice was added to the plan of the various sacrifices we have always made to man. Religionists and scientists in amity and bliss, however else they disagreed, could all agree on this. And the gist of all their discourse when you got down to it was we could not help the ballot because we were not fit. They would not hear the reason. They would not fairly yield. They would not own the arguments were beaten in the field. But time passed on. And some way, we need to ask them how. Whatever ails those arguments, we do not hear them now. You may talk of suffrage now with an educated man, and he agrees with all you say so sweetly as he can. It would be better for us all, of course, if womanhood was free. But the women do not want it, and so it must not be. It is such a tender thoughtfulness, so exquisite a care, not to pile on our frail shoulders what we do not wish to hear. But, oh, most generous brother, let us look a little more. Have we women always wanted what you gave to us before? Did we ask for veils and harems in the oriental races? Did we beseech to be unclean, shut out of sacred places? Did we beg for scolding bridles and ducking stools to come, and clamour for the beating stick no thicker than your thumb? Did we ask to be forbidden from all that teaches all the jobs that pay, did we claim the lower wages for a man's full work today? Have we petitioned for the laws 
wherein our shame is shown, that not a woman's child, nor even her own body, is her own. What women want has never been a strongly acting cause. When a woman has been wronged by man in churches, customs, laws, why should we find his preference so largely in his way when he himself admits the right of what we ask today? Uh, the suffrage movement was having a pretty hard job uh, and there wasn't much, much support from anyone from it. But one family vision whose vision and endeavour was instrumental in changing that public opinion was the Pankhursts. Emmeline and Richard Pankhurst and their daughters, Christabel, Sylvia and Adela, were to change the course of history. Both Emmeline Goulden and Richard Pankhurst had fine political pedigrees. Each came from progressive political backgrounds. In fact, Emmeline was just 14 when her mother took her to the suffrage uh, movement. So both her parents were active also in the anti-slave movement. There is very little known about Richard Pankhurst's background, which is surprising, as he was one of without a doubt, one of the few male advocates of women's equality at the time. <coughs> his parents encouraged his political ambition. Richard was a man who was committed to women's equality. In fact, he was the chief speaker in the very first public meeting for women's suffrage, which was held at the Free Trade Hall in Manchester on April 1868. So he was the man who absolutely supported our cause. God bless him. We need more of those men now. <laughs> Emmeline Golden and Richard Pankhurst met in Manchester. They met at, unsurprisingly, a women's suffragette movement meeting. Because Richard was already well known in the movement. He was 40, 44 and known affectionately as the Red Doctor. His job as a barrister meant that he could assist the movement in its parliamentary work. Being a male suffragette during this time was an extremely unpopular choice. It would have compromised his life professionally and financially made him an easy target for derision and ridicule from his peers. He was actually a member of the Liberal Party, though regarded as an extremist. Uh, I'm going to read you some of the things he championed for, and you can see why people were shocked. What he championed for was free education for children, abolition of the House of Lords, which he described as a public abattoir butchering the liberties of the people, home rule for Ireland, independence for India, nationalisation and the disestablishment of the Church of England, which he described as a portentous beetle. <laughs> These were very shocking demands and views indeed, but they were music to Emmeline Golden's ears. The two hit it off immediately and married in 1879 shortly after their meeting. Their marriage lasted 19 years until Richard's untimely death. And Richard said their marriage was a political partnership wherein every struggling cause shall be ours. It is also clear from later accounts written by their children that he also loved and adored his wife. After his death, Emmeline described their married life together as happy years that were nearly as perfect as home life and re relations can be in this very imperfect world. Both of them lived for politics. Despite having such a large family, Richard made sure that Emmeline was not turned into a household machine. And he encouraged and supported her 
to whilst the children, and they had five children. They had their first child, Christabel, and then Sylvia, Adela, Francis, and Henry in very, very quick succession. Uh, they both shared very strong views on bringing up those children, wanting them to benefit from a similar liberal background to their own. The Pankhurst children were a close-knit and loving family. Their children were educated at home until their teens, as Emmeline didn't want their creativity to be stifled. Richard encouraged the children to be independent, confident, and to serve their community. There was no inequality in the Pankhurst home, and that radical and inspirational education that the children received was to have a massive impact on the future life and expectations of Christabel, Adela, and Sylvia Pankhurst. In 1886, the family moved from Manchester to London. From 1888 to 1892, they lived at 8 Russell Square, which has since been absorbed by this very hotel. You'll see that there's a placard outside that says that they lived here. The whole row of houses was demolished and this hotel was built. So they have a fine history in this hotel of parliamentary activists. One of the reasons uh, why the Pankhurst moved to London was to pave the way for Richard to become an MP. He stood for election as the Liberal candidate for Rotherhide, but he failed to be elected. In fact, that first move to London was a disastrous one on many levels. Their youngest child died of diphtheria, and whilst still dealing with that grief, Richard suffered an extended bout of ill health. William Gladstone was the Prime Minister at that time, and he was proving to be an implacable foe to their political hopes. In 1893, the family were forced to cut their losses and return to Manchester. But all was not lost. The Packhurst family flourished in Manchester, they joined the emerging New Labour Party and the Suffragette Society, and their home was filled once again with friends, political allies, and lively discussions. Many happy years passed. But in 1898, tragedy struck. Richard suddenly died, and Emmeline was left with the responsibility of caring and providing for their family. The eldest, Christabel, being only 17 years of age. She later described Richard's death as an irreparable loss. Emmeline managed to <coughs> secure a salaried job as a registrar of birth and death and was elected to sit on the Manchester School Board. Her children, were growing up, and Christabel, Adela, and Sylvia were champing at the bit to be allowed to take a more active role in the suffragette movement. They were very frustrated at the lack of progress the older generation seemed to be, seemed to be making, and there was a great deal of acrimonious discussion within the Pankhurst house about the old fogies that, in their opinion, was holding up the movement of women's equality. Emmeline realized that much could be gained by combining the experience of the older, wearied suffragette workers with the youthful, enthusiastic ones. She and her daughters together sought a union of young and old who would find new methods, blaze new trails. In 1903, Emmeline, Christabel, Adela, and Sylvia set up the Women's Social and Democratic Party. Its motto was, Deeds, Not Words. Initially, it was based in Manchester, but then later moved to London, to Caxton House in WC1. 
on the 6th of February 1918, the representation of the People's Act was pushed through Parliament. It was the beginning of equal voting rights for women and the conti continuous of the struggle for equal opportunities for women, which is still continuing to this day. And I was actually commissioned to write a poem to celebrate a 100 year anniversary. Uh, and this is the poem I wrote. It's called A Century of Suffrage. Hurrah for the suffragettes who 100 years ago fought for the right of women to vote, struck inequality a deadly blow. Let us not forget the struggle against the gender discrimination of every woman, of every race, of every female in this nation. Let's remind employers and unions that equal job means equal pay. Let's change the law and enforce it to make sure it stays that way. Sexual harassment in the workplace is something that has to end. A woman's right to feel safe at work is a right we all need to defend. The success of our country's economy relies on women to work. Professional success and opportunity is not just a masculine perk. In honor of the suffragettes, let us men and women agree, sexual discrimination thwarts potential. It's equality that sets us free. Thank you.